notice in charge of BMI. Oh, and he's going to even talk, give a little bit of his background. So I would like for us, the Hershey Civil War Roundtable, the general public, or whatever, to give Keith and his wife, Pat, a nice, warm Hershey welcome.
1800, a guy named Cornelius Dorman, he was the jailer in Lexington. He was known quite well by the community. He uh, comes across the street from where his jail was located at the courthouse, and he buys a little plot of land and builds a very small I-frame house, a two over two house, a humble building that he planned to move his family into. Uh, the, the, the city would provide him a different residence very shortly, and he starts to rent this place out. It was a pretty good uh, investment property, as it turns out. By 1845, he sells it to a local up-and-coming doctor, Archibald Graham. Archibald Graham is not only building his profession, he's building his family, and he needs more space. So on the back of that uh, brick structure facing Washington Street, he builds an addition, uh, a stone addition to the rear, doubles the size of the house. He puts a special front door on, he changes the petitioning inside a bit, and puts a special front door on just so his patients can come in and have their examinations and not bother the children running around through the rest of the house. It, it's serving as uh, something of a, a medical facility for the local community. 1845 to 1858, at which time, and by the way, in this picture here, you can see uh, the back of that stone part of the structure, uh, the back porch of Dr. Archibald Graham's house. And there is the, the courthouse and the jail is right over there uh, that uh, made the, its uh, proximity convenient. 1851, the city of Lexington is going to in, in, involve itself in a great of uh, 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 improvement project, hilly. Lexington is a very hilly part of Virginia, and they lower the streets in certain places by as much as six feet, and raise them in other places by as much six as six, six feet to, to level things out. And it just so happened in front of Dr. Graham's house, they lowered the street uh, six feet, which resulted in their front door, right there, being six feet above the sidewalk. So this. Uh, uh, entryway and steps had to be added to the house at that time. And that will be pretty much what was on the market when Major and Mrs. Jackson were in the, uh, uh, in the real estate acquisition business. Jackson and the, the Jacksons move into this house in January of 1859, and Jackson could not have been happier. Jackson, Jackson was an orphan by the age of seven, a story I'm sure you know. The thing that he had wanted to get out of life was, was evading him, a family. He had never known a family. And now it was his chance to create one with his new wife. Their children would be raised in this house, he anticipated. And he goes to work improving this place. He puts on a new roof, a new tin roof, right away, and makes other improvements. Now, his neighbors, the community is growing. The Davidson sisters are going to build a house very similar to his right next door. And they began to add uh, uh, improvements and additions onto their property pretty soon. Tom Jackson's never going to change the footprint of his house. In fact, it was a lot of house for two people. Mariana complains that this was the wrong house for us. It's way too big for two people. It's not in a particularly good part of town. And she had a, a, a different version of maybe what we might watch one of those TV shows on the, uh, the Home and Garden Channel or whatever that is. My wife was watching constantly where, you know, you're imagining your perfect dream house. Well, there is a sketch in Mariana's hand of her perfect dream house. It would be of the latest fashion, a two-story maybe with a side addition, but of the Italian style that was raging around the country in the late mid-1850s. She literally writes this on the back of a proverbial envelope. We have the original in our collection still today. So Mariana, not quite as in love with the prop place as Tom would prove to be. But notice, the Jacksons would own this house for 50, well, you, when you do the math, you say, it's not 50 years, but it's almost 50 years, a half a century. Tom Jackson's not going to live a half a century, as you well know, uh, beyond the Civil War. But Mariana does. She lives up into the 20th century. The Jacksons would be content, upwardly mobile Victorians here, investing in the local community, pursuing his career as a college professor, teaching artillery tactics to the young cadets at BMI for a decade. In fact, the men that would ultimately become the backbone of the Army of Northern Virginia Artillery Corps under General Pendleton, serving throughout the state, throughout the South. <coughs> In 
in the parlor of that house, it's a Sunday. A Sunday morning, the Jacksons would normally be preparing to walk the two and a half blocks down to the Presbyterian Church, where they always were on Sunday mornings. Jackson teaching a Sunday school class in the afternoon for African Americans in the community. This particular Sunday would be different. It's not a typical Sunday. It's April the 21st, 1861. Jackson has received orders to take a cadet corps to Richmond to serve as drill masters for the Army, for, for recruits like these young gentlemen who would be pouring into Richmond. I want to be a Confederate soldier. Well, somebody had to teach them how to do that. It would be the VMI Cadet Corps, and Major Thomas Jackson would take them to Richmond to learn that craft. The first commands that Jackson gave during the American Civil War was on the morning of April the 21st, 1861, when he took command of the cadets by the right flank forward march. Off they went. Jackson is not going to return to this house. He never returns to Lexington in life again. Before he leaves that house, he and Mariana go into the parlor, and they kneel, and they pray about the future, the future that they expected in their home, and the future that was becoming a reality for them in their lives on that Sunday morning. Mariana is going to be leaving the house, too, as it turns out. She goes down to be with her family. The war's not going to last very long. It's an opportunity to reacquaint with all of our cousins down in Davidson and Charlotte, North Carolina. She'll never return to the house either, as it turns out. Not that she dies, but it's no point going back to that house with its sad memories after the war. In fact, she doesn't return to the house, but she can't let it go either. It's, it's, it's her connection with Tom and the guard and all of those things, the aspirations that they had envisioned, the family that they would raise in that house. It was embodied in that brick and stone structure, but she never returns to it. She rents it out to a series of tenants over the next several decades, almost 50 years, way beyond the time that she should have kept it of her, of her own interest. This is a photograph of it showing the, the, the depreciated uh, uh, structure of about 1890. That's from a postcard. The postcard says home of General Jackson, Lexington, Virginia. Uh, the thing that fascinates me about that postcard, that even in that disheveled, dilapidated version, it was still revered, a shrine, if you will, as the home of Stonewall Jackson. Mrs. Jackson, about 1904, contacts the local chapter of the United Daughters of Confederacy, the Mary Custis Lee chapter, to be exact and suggested that they might want to buy this house from, from her to turn it into a widow's home for the, the local community. The UDC chapter said, we have a bigger need even than that here in the community. We don't have a hospital. So the UDC would buy this house in 1906 from Mrs. Jackson and turn it into the first general hospital for the community of Lexington and Rockbridge County. Doing so meant many additions would be added to that structure. Remember, there's Tom's house. That's Tom and Marietta's house there. And now all of this, these elements have been added. The Davidson sisters' house, uh, they've, it's been connected with a, 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 a bridge connector here. Uh, pilasters and a pylon uh, impediment has been added to the structures to give them a more sophisticated public facility look as opposed to a private home look in this era that the Jackson's humble house becomes a hospital for the community. Uh, it had already sort of had a little flavor of that back in Archibald Graham's time when he lived there in the 1840s. And that will be the facade that faced 8 East Washington Street during its time, its 50 years, as the local general hospital. The only thing that you could uh, identify as being Jackson's house is the roof line up there in the chimneys. These ladies are located in that sun porch on the side that that picture was taken. But this community would serve, the hospital would serve the, the black and the white community of Lexington through World War I, through World War II, through epidemics. This is a photograph of the extensions that were added to the back 
to accommodate the growing needs of the community. And in 1954, the community finally <coughs> created a purpose-built hospital just on the edge of town, on about 12 acres of land, where they could expand as much as the community needed. It's still there today, the Stonewall Jackson Carillion Hospital, as it's known today. So this house, the hospital, is vacated on uh, Washington Street. Uh, and this is what it looked like. If you would have visited between 1954 and, and mid-1970s, this is the house that you would have visited as Stonewall Jackson's house, but it doesn't look anything like the house in which Stonewall Jackson, it's only the location. But somewhere hidden back behind all this stuff, the, the, house, the house was waiting to be revealed again. But not yet. The house, during the period of 1954 to 1976, a period in which its own, a guy named Jay Johns, a blind attorney, as it turns out, but a, a lover of history, an admirer of Jackson, purchased the house with the intention of creating a shrine to his favorite hero of the past, Stonewall Jackson. And it, it's, no buildings, no, no uh, structures were removed, that footprint remained the same. But in the front rooms of the original portion of the house, this section, uh, they set up a couple of period rooms to sort of get the flavor of what it might have been like when Tom and Mariana and the six slaves that lived there with them, when they were in residence, 18, late 1850s. Uh, this uh, is, a, is a photograph of one of those rooms. Uh, the way you knew what belonged to Stonewall and Mariana it had little red tapes on it. So whenever you see a red tape, you knew that that was a Jackson artifact. I, I doubt if Jackson had a portrait of himself hanging in his dining room, but uh, uh, Jay Johns put one there, just so you wouldn't forget whose house it was. But in the mid-1970s, an organization called the Historical Lexington Foundation acquired the property with the intention of turning back time, turning it back <clears throat> to when that little upward mobile Victorian family took residence there with their aspirations in 1858. A forensic architectural study exhaustive was done on the property to determine what was original, what had been added, and the house began to reveal itself and tell those researchers what it wanted to be. But its journey was not yet complete. So as this process took place, all of those additions began to be peeled back, layer after layer, until they revealed the core of the building that Tom had acquired for $3,000, by the way, in 1958. It stretched him economically. It was all he could do to pay that mortgage for buying that property. But now with the core of the house, the original house revealed, the internal work to begin to recreate the spaces in which that family spent those first, those last months before Civil War would break them apart. Just a few months before the house was ready to be open to the public again, as Tom and Mariana's house, disaster struck. Uh, a fire broke out on one January night in 1979, and it threatened to destroy the entire property. Fortunately, the fire department acted quickly, and very little damage, in a relative sense, was done and it could be restored. So by October of that year, 1979, the local paper proudly announced that the house would open once again that fall. Mrs. Jackson was, well, I should say, Tom and Mariana's granddaughter uh, was at that event. She was about uh, 95 years old at that point. Uh, she, she lived for another uh, 10, or, 10 or 12 years, as it turned out. I, too, was at that event in 1975 to witness the reopening of, of Tom and Marianne's house. Today, when you visit the house, you'll see rooms interpreted with Jackson period, Jackson's own furnishings and period furnishings, recreating the lifestyle that they wish to establish for themselves. And I need to tell you, that every summer they were together, they didn't spend the summer at Natural Bridge, one of our favorite attractions in Rock Ridge County. They would go to 
Niagara Falls, or they would take the springs in Sarasota, or they would go to Manhattan or Philadelphia. Philadelphia was their favorite place to go furniture shopping for their new house. And so it is that that local stuff just wouldn't do. They wanted to find stuff from Philadelphia that they had shipped back to them in their house at 8 East Washington Street. Imagine the, the conversations that are taking place in those rooms in 1860. War clouds are gathering. Uh, we're not sure what the future might hold. Jackson insisted up to the last moment that he was a strong unionist. He saw no reason for the nation to tear itself apart. But when orders came and Virginia left the Union on the 17th of April, 1861, his destiny became clear. So the story the House tells today is a, of an American family, not unlike us, struggling on day-to-day -day issues and dealing with the pressing concerns of the time that would not only lead the nation to be torn apart, but this small little family. The Jacksons, the children that they planned to raise in that house, there would be one child, a daughter, that would live to uh, adulthood. Uh, Jackson had the good fortune of holding that precious child uh, just weeks before he would be accidentally uh, and mortally wounded at Chancellorsville. That daughter will grow up, and she has a daughter. But Tom and Marianna's daughter, by age 28, is dead. So that granddaughter gets raised by her grandmother. So there's a very close, intimate collect connection between those generations. It would be that granddaughter that presided over the, the, uh, the rededication of her grandparents' house in 1879. The house, once again, is alive with the spirit of the family that moved in there so with great expectations in 1859. A family who could not anticipate or predict the future as we know it. But now we can appreciate the past through the experience of that house. 218 years that house is set there, welcoming <laughs> families, births, deaths, aiding the community as a hospital, and now aiding the community, and by the way, you're the community, aiding the community to understand how we got to where we are today. Now, when Jackson left BMI, he mounts a horse. Officers usually get to ride horses. The enlisted men are going to be marching to Richmond. And quite often you see the great Stonewall Jackson being depicted on a horse, and he's, of course, most closely associated with the horse Little Sorrow that maybe some of you have seen. His hide is mounted in the BMI Museum. That is not Little Sorrow. That is uh, called artist license. Uh, and Little Sorrow, I don't think, ever looked that good in my or death. <laughs> but I want to tell you about that little horse, and really the three lives that that horse has led. The, 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 the life that brings him to prominence, internationally really, people, were, journalists were writing about Little Sorrow as they wrote about Jackson in the papers in Paris and Germany and England, not to mention New York and Boston. <clears throat> Jackson's first command, after he takes the cadets to Richmond, he's assigned to go off to Harper's Ferry, where you're going to be going uh, in, in the spring. In fact, he was there about the same time of year. Uh, Harper's Ferry, pivotal point, critical strategic point for Virginia. The Baltimore Ohio Railroad runs east and west through that area. Now, Little Sorrow, we are not sure where he was born. Some say he was born up in Connecticut. But somehow he got out to a farm in Ohio because we do know that in the spring of 1861 he is on a eastbound Baltimore and Ohio train which will be intersected uh, by uh, welcoming Confederate troops. The horses that were on that train, including the horse that's going to become known as Little Sorrow, were destined for the Union Army, for the cavalry of the Union Army, which as you remember in the early war wasn't quite, well, there was a lot of work to be done for those guys. 
And little Sorrow was going to be a part of that. He was going to be a part of the Union Army. Not realizing that Jackson and his uh, quartermaster, Commander Harmon, had different plans. They took all those horses. And Jackson goes down to pick out a couple for himself. And the relationship that developed almost instantly between master and animal was, was palatable. People commented on it at the time. Just, a, just a, an animal you want to hug, that little sorrel horse. Well, Jackson said, this is a wonderful gift for Mary Ann. She'll so love having this horse back down in North Carolina until I get home and we can take him up to, uh, to Lexington. As it turns out, mo as most generals, it's not the only horse that Jackson had. He had several. Uh, competing for top horse in the Jackson stable was Big Sorrel, to be distinguished from the Little Sorrel. Uh, Jackson, yeah, it was a competent horse. He could be ridden in battle. Trojan horse, uh, which turned out to be an appropriate name. It was a gift of admirers, which got returned pretty soon because it wasn't a horse for a battlefield. Molly, sort of a similar story there. A beautiful horse, but uh, apparently, but but uh, not quite cut out for the the, 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 the confusion and the noise of the battle. Uh, and Superior, Jackson uh, tried to perfect his horsemanship enough to use Superior on a number of occasions. Superior was a bay stallion, uh, probably more horse than Jackson would have been comfortable with. When there was serious work on the battlefield to be done, you wanted a stable platform from which to give those orders. And Lynn Sorrow would prove to be that now. Whenever Jackson knew he was going into battle, he would call for Little Sorrow to be brought up. So Mariana never gets her present. Jackson keeps Little Sorrow for himself. I've been fascinated by the relationship of these two horses and those two men. Truly, Little Sorrow is to Jackson as Traveler is to Lee. Traveler from Greenbrier County. We know his entire pedigree for, for several generations, just as we know Leeds. They were both FFVs, first families of Virginia. They were meant for each other. And the same kind of chemistry took place. The first time Lee saw the horse that would become Traveler, he was just struck with that horse and, and, and wanted to acquire it for his own. Gonzaro, <laughs> on the other hand, was something of an orphan himself. Not even sure where he was born. He only knows that he was on a train and somebody came and took possession of him. Just like Jackson, not first families of Virginia, struggling uh, to make their way in the world. Scruffy looking, in fact. <coughs> Yet there they are, the regal and, well, they're not so regal. <laughs> but this pair would find themselves together in all of these places over the next couple of years. One notable occasion was on June the 8th. It's a Sunday. Jackson, it's amazing. I'm sure you probably noticed this. How, many, how often is it that Jackson is going to fight a battle on a Sunday morning? So it would be in Fort Republic, just outside of Harrisonburg, Virginia, in the Shenandoah Valley, on June the 8th. Jackson, in fact, is getting, it's a beautiful day. It had been raining for weeks, and now one sunny some Sunday morning. Jackson is telling Lacey, uh, Reverend Lacey to go get the troops ready for, for, for church service. And then all of a sudden, a, a, a Confederate private races panic into Jackson's camp and says, there, there's Yankees in, in, in port, meaning in town, in Port Republic. Jackson, I think for the first time, it occurred to himself, gee, I'm here at my headquarters. My army is on the other side of a rain-swollen river about a mile away. Maybe I better go join them if there's Yankees so close by. So Jackson tells this young uh, 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 private, if there are Yankees in port, you need to go back and fight them. So this, this, this private wheels around and dashes off back into town. And Jackson, what does he do? He says, bring me little sorrow. And Jackson mounts little sorrow and those, those spindly little legs of that, that horse dashes down Main Street of Port Republic as fast as they could go. And Jackson's staff is, well, they tried to keep up with him, but they're being captured. The Union cavalry guys that were already literally in town were just picking them up one after another. Yet Jackson and Little Sorrow magically, and maybe without explanation, managed to get through all of that. 
and back safely across the other side of a river, across a covered bridge. Maybe some of you have stood there. The explanation is that's how Jackson was dressed. He's dressed in his old VMI officer's uniform, a blue United States Army uniform. Well, those guys from Ohio, they're also dressed in a similar uniform. <laughs> they're looking for the guys in the gray uniform. So then they see Jackson a little sorrow. They don't really recognize him, but he's wearing a blue uniform. He must be one of us. And he passes right through to safety to the other side of the river. So Jackson gets over there. He wheels the sorrow around over the bridge that they had just come across. And he sees a piece of artillery down there. And there's guys fumbling around with the artillery. Uh, there's, there's a guy here who fumbles around with artillery uh, uh, on occasion. And, and talking. But, so these guys are getting their gun ready. And Jackson, sitting on top, little Charles says, bring that gun over here. And nothing happens. Jackson's not, he's used to when he gives an order that something happens. Nothing happens. So Jackson stands up in his always overly adjusted stirrups stands up over Little Sorrow and says, bring that gun up here. And about that time, the gun fires, and the cannonball lands at Little Sorrow's feet and splatters them both with, with mud. Uh, at that point, Jackson realized, gee, maybe that's not our cannon. <laughs> Which uh, was, was true. So he turns to the Rock Ridge artillery and says, let them have it. And they began to return fire across the river. Close Oh, harrowing morning for Jackson and Little Sorrow. On the, the I, it's arguably the most successful day in Jackson's military career of successful days is on May the 2nd, 1863. Jackson has just completed a 12 mile flank march uh, around the Union Army. He's left Lee and Lee's section of the Army in front of the Union position and he's circumvented the Union Army. He hops out of the wilderness, literally, out of the wilderness into a field where he rolls up the right flank of the Union Corps there, 12th Corps. At the end of the day, Jackson and his staff go out in front of their lines to record order for the continuance of the battle on the following day. Jackson's men are returning to the line as the sun is going down. It's probably it's about 9, 9 p.m. They are coming into the line at the position of a, of a North Carolina brigade. In fact, the brigade's being commanded by one of Jackson's former students, a guy named James Lane. And right in the section being held by the 18th North Carolina, those fellows fatigued, exhausted, edgy, see horses in the darkness coming towards them. They fire on that supposed enemy and several of Jackson's staff fall out of the saddle dead. Keith Boswell, of note, a topical, topographic engineer. Jackson himself is wounded three times. Little Sorrel is wounded in that barrage of fire. Jackson receives a wound in his wrist, in his right wrist, in his left forearm, in his left shoulder. And Little Sorrel, for the only time on record that we know, panics and races off the, the, the orange turnpike into the brush, almost sweeping his master off out of the saddle. Jackson's men come to him realizing what had just occurred. They cut Jackson's raincoat that he was wearing off of him to see how much damage had been done. They put him on a litter and carry him to first and tent as a field hospital, then on to a little place called Denny Station. The amputation of the arm would take place that night, and everyone expected Jackson to live. It's better to lose a limb than to lose a life. Hunter McGuire, the surgeon, would have told you. Little Sorrel has wandered off into the wilderness. He's, he's captured. He's discovered by Union troops who, when they realize who they have captured, in an honorable way, return him to Jackson and to Mrs. Stonewall Jackson. She will be a widow very soon. She's with Jackson. It's a Sunday again. It's a Sunday, a prominent day in Jackson's life of eventful times. Jackson is told by Mariana that this will be the day he greets his Lord and says, this is great. I've always, I always wanted to die on a Sunday. And so he gets that last wish and he departs us. Then Sorrow, meanwhile, is still in the Union camp. And when word comes that Jackson's died, this is no longer a trophy. This is, a, this is a sacred item 
and it's returned to the widow. A new life in the post-war era. All of Jackson's belongings were sent down to his widow, who was with her family, a cottage home just outside of where Davidson College is located today. Her, husband, her father had been the president of Davidson College. And little Sorrel goes down there. Boy, he's had an adventurous life. He's ridden on trains. He's been in war. And now he's being put on a farm like some sort of plow horse. He has no interest in that. And he, he turns out that he's not earning his feet. And he becomes somewhat of a nuisance. He's letting the other animals out of their stalls by opening the, the, the gates. And, and Mary Anna's trying to what am I going to do with this horse that, you know, in kind of awkward situation? So her solution is that she will send him back up to the Institute where the cadets can take care of him at VMI. A perfect solution. Here's one of his handles. That's not a cadet. That's an un now unknown uh, individual taking uh, a look sorrow on the VMI parade ground. There's the barracks. Uh, in the background. Uh, this seemed like a perfect connection. Well, someone convinced Mrs. Jackson, the widow Jackson, that she should get that horse back because money can be made. People will pay to see that horse and we will travel him all through the South, all the way down to New Orleans and back. Well, they start that journey and people are paying to see Little Sorrow. But news journalists and editorials are being written saying, what a horrible thing to do. That horse has already paid its dues. This is, this is, this is just, just in, in, inappropriate to treat the great Stonewall Jackson's Civil War horse in this manner. So somewhat embarrassingly, the, the great money-making journey, uh, the crass capitalism, it is brought to a halt. And Mrs. Jackson says, uh, General Smith, he's commanding He's the superintendent of EMI. General Smith, I'd like to return a little sorrow to you now. And General Smith, literally, this is, is, is very interesting, he's a very calm, Episcopalian sort of guy. And he held Bible reading classes, Bible study in his home. And he gets really angry about this. And he says, I'm not going to touch that horse with a 10-foot foot pole. You're going to have to find something else to do with it. So he can't come back to Lexington. But... He goes, maybe appropriately, to the old soldier's home in Richmond, where he can be there with men to take care of him, that share that experience. On the same battlefields, they both, veterans of those same events. <laughs> the old soldier's home, located on Boulevard in Richmond, is where we're, several of the museums are located today. A couple of the buildings from their time are still there. It was about a 20-acre complex. Old Sorrel, Stonewall Jackson's war horse, died in the Confederate soldier's home near Richmond, 6 o'clock Monday, age 32. It's estimated, but he was well into his 30s, a very handsome age for a horse. Now in the hands of a skillful taxidermist, and when his work shall be completed, he will be lifelike and will be returned to the soldier's home. As long as there would be soldiers there, Little Sorrel would be with them. Frederick Webster was in the hands of that capable taxidermist. Frederick Webster is not a person that we know of today, very, very many of us, but he had revolutionized the world of taxidermy. He had created a new technique that would allow mounted hides, particularly large animals, to be photographically reproduced. The sinew, the muscle construction, could all be recreated uh, under the hide, thanks to the techniques just invented by Frederick Webster. He's working at the Smithsonian. He has been brought to Richmond. It's clear that Little Sorrel doesn't have much time. So they bring Frederick Webster down to be there, to start the process as soon as it is necessary. In fact, Webster is taking measurements while Little Sorrel is still alive, taking measurements from the horse. We get it just right. Here's Webster in his studio, and you can see one of his horse mounts in the back. No, that's a cat. Um, <laughs> To give you some idea of the process, they, the horse isn't stuffed. I've looked inside of him. It's hollow. There's nothing in there. The horse, but this is the process. First, the hide is removed and tanned like you would any uh, hide that you were preserving. And an armature, 
a, a, a statue, in essence, of the animal is created from those measurements you hopefully took from life, and you begin to build that up from wood and metal, and then you put a, a sizal over that to give it a, 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 a texture such as a, a fat and muscle. Uh, you use plaster of Paris to create the, the finer points uh, of uh, the exact musculature of the legs, for example. And then, when all of that is completed, you have something that kind of looks like the animal that you want to end up with. You take the hide and you drape it back over this and stitch it all together, and you end up with something like that. That is not Little Sorrow, that's a Comanche, uh, actually. I'll come back to you. Anybody know who Comanche is? Yeah, yeah, I'm very famous. Customs, yeah. yeah, Custer, very, very, very common. We'll get back to him in a second. Standing in the studios of Frederick Ed Webster, the taxidermist of Old Sorrow, the war horse of Stonewall, the stuffed figure of the famous animals placed in the attitude of attention, the heads and ears erect. Old Sorrow, you know, the most eventual in history, uh, will be returned to the old soldier's home. And so he was. And he would spend as many years there as there were old soldiers to come and reminisce with him. And late nights, maybe when they, insomnia was keeping them awake, they could go visit Little Sorrow there in his glass case on the old soldier's home. But eventually, they too would fade away. And the old soldier's home would be closed. Little Sorrow, the orphan, is again homeless. In 1949, when the old soldier's home closes, a request is made, can Little Sorrow now come back to Lexington? And the answer is yes. Bring him back to Lexington where he would be placed in the, the library, which is, was the location of the museum in those days, right after World War II. And there he is, down in the library building. Uh, the janitor of that building used to be very proud and, and loved telling visitors that he was the only person whose job responsibilities included watering a dead horse. <laughs> that was uh, required. That saddle was given to Jackson by British admirers during the war. We have that yet in the collection today. By 1971, Little Sorrow was in need, uh, need of a, a, a facelift. And the Smithsonian taxidermist, uh, Frank Greenwell, was asked to come down and do some patch-up repair work to Little Sorrow. Twice uh, in the 70s, resulting in the animal that you might have visited if you came during that time period. 19, in 2004, we had the opportunity to greatly expand the BMI Museum at Jackson Memorial Hall. Uh, it required, however, that we move everything out of the building. Uh, the entire 30,000 piece collection, including one of our most important pieces. So we carefully packaged Little Sorrow for hopefully his final journey. Carefully put him in this protective harness that you see there, and we rolled him successfully right to the door and realized he was too tall to go through the door. <laughs> so, what to do with it. My background, by the way, I'm a VMI graduate. I, 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 I took my undergraduate degree in civil engineering. So, I, we're going to figure this out. <laughs> so, the solution ended up being, well, we couldn't ask the horse to bow his head, and so he's a little stiff these days. So, we had to pick the rear end up, tilting the head down, cart and scoot him under, and, 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 uh, and get through the threshold. And that man successfully without breaking off any of the delicate tips of his ears. That was a real uh, concern. And here he is being carted down, being getting ready to be placed on this uh, flatbed uh, vehicle. Uh, you can see the construction is already uh, underway for the expansion of the museum. Little Sorrow would make that final journey down the Old Valley Pike, Route 11, complete this time though with police escort, <laughs> photographers along the sideways. Little Sorrow looking out over the parade ground, not unlike that earlier picture that you saw from 1883 of him standing there, that same building waiting for his return across the parade ground there. Now, we wanted to restore Little Sorrow. In 2006, it was, we were ready to move back into the facility. So we again had the Smithsonian taxidermy team for the National, uh, 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 National History Museum at the Smithsonian to come down, and they gave me a uh, detailed breakout of exactly all the work that they were going to accomplish. And the very first step was that we're going to take him outside and shampoo him. 
uh, and I, I just envision all of that hair just disappearing down, <laughs> floating away in the river, and we'd have a bald horse <laughs> in the show, that we took for, and somebody else would be directing the museum from that point. <laughs> and, and, and I said, well, tell me more about this. And no, no, we do this all the time. We wear our elephants, our zebras. We do this all the time. It's going to be fine. And they explained to me that one of the secret ingredients was in those green bottles right there that they were shampooing with. Uh, it's called Pert. Pert shampoo. They went down to this. They went down, to, and we paid big money for this. Right? They, they probably something given by Civil War uh, 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 round thing. Uh, they went down to the local Walmart and bought two boxes of Pert stuff and gave it a good, good going over there. It's his first bath in 150 years. <laughs> It's almost like being there, isn't it? <laughs> this work actually took about three and a half months. They could do but so much work, and then they have to leave and let that cure and dry, and then come back and do more work. And finally, to have the mount that we have today, a, a, a fresh, refreshing blue sorrow. Uh, there you see with Jackson Saddle waiting to tell his story as, as a participant, a spectator, a veteran of those events that we all know so well. Now, I, I might mention that Little Sorrel's skeleton is not inside of him. That was removed by Frederick Webster, and Frederick Webster kept it as part of his payment for doing this work. He has it at the Carnegie Mellon Institute up in somewhere in Pennsylvania. I don't know where that is. Anybody know where that is? Oh, of course, in Pittsburgh. Well, it's up there in Pittsburgh, up here in Philadelphia, in, in, in Pennsylvania. So finally, they have no longer service for it. But 1929, it too comes back to BMI, but we can't get it back inside the horse. So instead, it goes down to the biology building where he is serving science. Cadets are able to examine an articulated skeleton of a large mammal who just happens to be. Little Sorrow, Stonewall Jackson's horse. Uh, by 19, the 1990s, Bud Robertson's uh, uh, epic biography of Jackson had come out, and Bud and I are talking one day. He says, "Keith, you know, it's just, it's just, we need to bury that horse. It's just, it's just not right." He's not right. And, I, I mean, and I'm thinking, we're not going to bury our most important ar artifact in the museum. But, but I have a, I have a, a compromise. We have his bones in the back room. Uh, and uh, maybe we could bury the bones. Would that satisfy? And uh, on July the 20th, 1997, one of the hottest Julys in, on record, I'm sure, over 500 of Little Sorrow's closest friends came to witness the burial of this old veteran on the VMI parade ground, literally in the shadow of Jackson's statue there on the parade ground. Now, one thing that happened that UDC was a very much a part of this event and they, unbeknownst to me, had told all of their members who were coming from all over the Commonwealth of Virginia and Maryland, Pennsylvania, to gather there on that hot day to grab a little land of the battlefield that's closest to you, where Jackson and Little Sorrow were, uh, uh, Manassas, uh, Sharpsburg, Fredericksburg, Port Republic, Cross Keys, uh, Kernstown, all of those places, and bring them to the burial ceremony. And Near the end of that ceremony, and it was hot, I repeat again, I'm, I'm the master of ceremonies, if you will, for lack of a better term. I, uh, in the sweltering heat, uh, I told folks, if you would like to participate in this event, there's dirt down here. Select your, the dirt most meaningful to you in relation to Jackson, and help us bury this horse. And I figured like three people would do that, because the rest of them are going to be running for the shade at this, but it's a culmination of this ceremony. Patiently, dutifully, almost all of those 500 people lined up, waiting for their opportunity to be a part of this history, to be a part of it, to participate in it. And so now, the soil of all of those battlefields are intermingled with the soil of the VMI parade ground. So when the cadets are marching there every Friday afternoon at 4.35, and you could come and see them, they're marching literally on the ground of these battles. It was covered by newspapers around the country and foreign press. I know you're going to ask this question, 
Uh, I'll answer it now. So how many historically significant mounted horse hides are there in the world, you might ask? Well, there's only this many. There's less than a dozen, as it turns out. Uh, the earliest one, I was shocked to find <coughs> Uh, 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 king, Sweden, uh, Sweden's King Gustavus Adolphus, who is sometimes noted as the really the, the creator of modern day cavalry tactics, lost his mount during battle in 1632 and had him mounted. That horse has been standing like that since 1632. It makes little sorrow look like, you know, yesterday. And earlier examples of uh, 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 Peter the Great's horse, uh, let's say, uh, 1832. Uh, you know, well, I, let me point out how awkward that mount looks. It just looks, it's just not, is that really a horse? I'm not sure. Uh, Frederick Webster would, would do a lot to create it. Uh, Wexley, who gets uh, mortally wounded in the Battle of, uh, of Waterloo, uh, he was the mount of, uh, of uh, William of Orange. Of course, one of Napoleon's horses here, uh, Le Vizier. 1826, as Napoleon's initials stamped on his on his rump there. What a what an honor that was. Uh, Winchester, also known as Renzi, Phil Sheridan's horse, and he rode triumphantly from Winchester to Cedar Creek at that pitiful moment of that battle, rallying the troops and achieving victory, riding on that black horse, uh, uh, Winchester. He is now at the Smithsonian. In fact, Winchester and Little Sorrow are the only two mounted horses that you can go and visit today from the American Civil War. Over three million horses and mules died during that war. And Winchester and Little Sorrow were survivors. And of course, as we had already mentioned, Comanche, 1890, the last, the only survivors we know, uh, the only mm, white survivor uh, of uh, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, Custer's last stand. Uh, Custer had fought down in the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, <coughs> And his, uh, his demise was met with some relief, I would have to say, in 1876. Comanche was there. He moves back into his camp, riddled with arrows penetrating his body. You know, a horse can take a lot more damage than a man can. I mentioned Little Sorrow was wounded several times throughout the war. He never really showed any marks of it. He could absorb that 58 caliber ball. Jackson could. Comanche could absorb those slings and arrows would live a right life. Farlap, a very famous uh, 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 racehorse in uh, uh, Australia. One of the, actually, I think the finest mounted horse really to be seen anywhere. That horse could, could step away, and you wouldn't be surprised. It's so well done. And who could forget Misty and her bold story? Does anyone, have you forgotten Misty? Did anyone remember Misty? Don't remember. <laughs> Misty of Chincoteague, the Walt Disney movie, and of course the, 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 the uh, a story from the late 1940s about this young, young Chincoteague uh, pony, uh, these wild ponies that still live on Assateague Island. In fact, my wife Pat and I were just there two weeks ago. Uh, we visited Misty. I took better pictures of her, but I didn't have a chance to get one in here. But there she is. I guess that looks like a pony. Uh, the taxidermy there might be lacking. And of course, the trigger. The little sorrow is there with a very special place to remind us of then and for us to reflect on now. Uh, of course, as a, a sentient being that participated, that witnessed all of these things that we go now today to, to, to glean understanding and meaning from. Maybe that, that horse can help us with that. And that's what I wanted to tell you about Jackson's home and Jackson's horse. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So when Little Sorrel was dying and they took all the measurements, they took the skeleton out and they did the back of it, is any of the fur on Little Sorrel, Little Sorrel's real fur? Oh, oh, absolutely. Uh, at least 95% of it is his fur, his hide. Uh, 
Uh, one of the amazing things is that the, as techniques advance, uh, uh, they become, uh, uh, as time goes on, techniques uh, become uh, 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 perfected. The work that the Smithsonian taxidermists did most recently in 2006, and it's about time to get them back, but when they cleaned mm -hmm. off Little Sorrel's head, the fine little muzzle hair that every horse has is there. Little Sorrel's muzzle hair is still there. Uh, it looks like a, a, a man that didn't shave very well, you know, in the morning. But when, when he was undergoing this process, uh, my wife Pat was there examining the horse. She's, she's, she's ridden horses all of her life. She's very interested in this. And the taxidermist said, smell, they were working on his, his, his hind quarters, shall I say, at that point. And they said, oh, Pat, come over here and smell this. And really, okay. Uh, and, and so she does, beautifully. And what she experienced was the smell that you would find if you walked up to your horse in a stall. That exact smell is what she experienced. It still smells like a horse. Still smells like a horse. Now, there is a photograph out there that made it into the AP wires of my wife's sniffing this horse's tail. <laughs> you can Google that. You can Google that. Wife sniffing horse's tail. I, I don't know. But almost 95% of what you see is little sorrow, is that hot. In fact, there are things called saddle markings that, that happen when horses are rubbed with the saddles, you know, to affect the, the, sometimes the colorations of their, of their uh, uh, hide. And uh, I can identify photographs uh, that's because people are constantly bringing is this little song? Is this Stonewall Jackson? He has a beard, it must be Stonewall Jackson. Uh, I can identify pictures uh, of real pictures of little sorrow based on the hide that we have today. Because so those saddle marks, those <laughs> saddle spots are exactly where they're supposed to be if the, if the pictures are accurate. Five, 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 five. Yes, sir. What does sorrel mean, and why did Jackson choose that name? Is there well, behind that? It, 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 it's a color, a uh, reddish color, and little sorrel was dis distinguished him from another red horse that Jackson had that was bigger. Little sorrel is only just slightly over 14 hands. Uh, uh, not big for a horse, a big for a pony, uh, but uh, 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 that was a distinguishing nomenclature. Bring me the little sorrel. Now, he was also known as Fancy, which was almost uh, a, a jokey because the horse was anything but Fancy. Uh, so uh, that was sort of an a, a, a inside joke to call him Fancy. But uh, uh, Little Sorrel, Fancy, uh, uh, those were names that, that folks of his time knew him by. <coughs> yes, sir? I read an article uh, where he near the end of his life. Got to be a knight. They, they had him in a sling because yes, of his back so You're, you're absolutely right. That, that, I didn't go into that detail, but you're, 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 you're correct. Little Charles had gotten so feeble that in order to make have him stand, he could not raise himself any longer. So they, the, the old soldiers created this hoist and a belt around his midsection to, to help him stand up and receive his visitors as they plucked hair out of his mane and out of his tail of souvenirs. Uh, one day, as they were going through this process, that belt slipped, and Little Sorrow fell to the ground and, and fractured his back. And that's what precipitated his, his death. That's when they knew we need to get the taxidermist down here right away, and uh, uh, Frederick Webster arrived. I, if you look at Little Sorrow today, his head is erect, and his head is back, and his eyes are large, as it said in that newspaper clipping, as, as if he's in a position of attention. I think he's panicked. I think it's 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 this taxidermist measuring him for something like what's going on here? What 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 are you saying? Yes, sir. When I visited BMI, I can't remember exactly what year it was, but he was still on display behind the wooden fence. Correct. Yes. Right. And I stood up. And just a little while. I stood up next to him. I realized he's not that big a horse. That's right. Yeah. And I was wondering how tall was Jackson? How far the legs? The legs? <laughs> Jackson. Jackson was just under six feet, right around 5'11". Okay. Jackson, Jackson weighed about 140 pounds. Uh, uh, you know, we talk about people being smaller back then. 
uh, people weren't as wide back then. People were narrow back then. But, you know, of, of pretty, pretty normal height. Uh, Jackson took care of that long legged appearance by cinching up the stirrups quite a bit and keeping a, 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 a lot of uh, a, a bend uh, in his leg. But uh, you're right, Jackson was, would have been sort of awkward looking. On, on that size horse. I punched the horse. I don't have uh oh. Well, I have to talk to you about that. There's an extra charge for touching the horse. I said it was the center tab. Oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> yes, sir. The piano that is located in the Jackson home, is that original? It is. Uh, it, it is. It's one of the Jackson pieces. And we are very excited about a project that's just starting to have that piano restored so that we can literally play it. Uh, when we have events in, in the house. Uh, we had the piano that belonged to Matthew Fontaine Mari. Some of you might recognize that name, Pathfinder of the Seas. Uh, we have his Steinway piano that he purchased for his home when he was a professor at DMI. We had that restored, and we played that when we're having evening programs in the museum. So we'd like to, like to have the same uh, effect in the Jackson House. What, what a neat experience that would be to hear those sounds filling those rooms uh, again. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I'm going to explain these in the Jackson House. You all need some short arms and you're showing the house across the street and all. Do you have that house also? We do. We do. That house is now in administrative offices. And we are uh, literally at this time, we're building a new orientation center uh, that will house ticketing, shop, sales area, and an orientation room. Uh, and we're moving all of that out of the historic house. If you visited the Jackson house before, you know you come in the back door and you're right there in the shop and it's sort of, sort of tight. Uh, we're moving all of those service activities out of the historic property and into this new building that's being built on the back of the Davidson Tucker house, as you were mentioning, uh, so that that will open up more period interpretive space in the Jackson's home. And part of the story that we will tell in that basement area is the story of those other Jacksons that lived there, uh, this, the six other Jacksons, the African-American Jacksons, two of whom came to Jackson and asked them to, to purchase them and to arrange for them to then be able to buy their freedom from him eventually. Uh, we have made contact back with, those, with one of those families, by the way, that's still living down in North Carolina. I would like to ask you a question for the chair. I want you to take a moment and tell them the consultant for a, a movie and, and the most famous actor that you got to work with and so forth. I, I want you to tell them that it's really phenomenal. I want you to take a moment to well, well, one of the things that, uh, as a public historian, one of the things that I uh, 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 had the good fortune to do is be involved in the, in the film industry for uh, my first film project was 1985 uh, and I have to tell you that was the most exciting job that I ever had as a consultant because I got to meet my childhood uh, uh, TV star hero Lloyd Bridges of Sea Hunt was in that movie uh, 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 Hal Holbrook was in that movie uh, 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 Alec Baldwin was in that movie. I had no idea who he was. He was a TV soap opera guy. I didn't know who he was. Uh, uh, but there was another guy, Eddie Albert, was in that movie. And one time, I, I, I was, uh, and I'm on, I'm, uh, what, I don't know how old I am. Uh, I mean, I know how old I am, but man, I, I, was, I wasn't 30 years old. And I'm standing there with uh, 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 Mr. Albert, and uh, we're waiting for something to happen. Do that a lot, uh, you know, on sets. And I began to make small talk. I said, Mr. Albert, do you, do you remember being in a movie with, uh, with, uh, about, uh, uh, called Brother Rat with Ronald Reagan and Wayne Morris and Priscilla Lane? And he's going, Brother Rat? No, I don't think I ever was in a movie with that name. And I'm, I'm thinking, well, certainly he hasn't forgotten. And I, and I go on to encourage his memory. Uh, you know, it was about uh, some cadets at the Virginia Military Institute. And uh, it, it, it uh, and he's saying, no, no, I was never in that movie. So now I'm really getting nervous. I said, oh, well, sorry, sir. I still thought that you were in it. So we stand there for like another three or four, which seemed like me a half an hour, uh, of the painful minutes of silence. And he says, of course I remember being in Brother Rat. That was my very first film. 
blah, 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 and he starts talking about it. Uh, and and uh, that, that was interesting to me because it was about BMI. Uh, you know, the movie came out in 1939, and he had been in the theater version as well as the film version, so I knew he couldn't have forgotten about it. But uh, over the years, many other films, um, uh, and we were talking about Gettysburg, uh, Gods and Generals, uh, and uh, I was uh, uh, Stephen Lang's uh, character coach uh, for his role as, uh, as Jackson. Bud Robertson was Robert Duvall's character coach for, for, for me, and I think, I think both of those guys, did a, were, I mean, they really did a remarkable job capturing those, those individuals. When we did our little premiere of Gods and Generals at BMI, uh, Jackson's closest living relative uh, was going to be there. And, and Stephen says, you think I could sit beside her? Which he did. <laughs> and uh, very good day. She, she very much enjoyed that. Okay, so first of all, 